Okay. And you ready for me to get started? Yeah, with that, I'll turn it over to Kate. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. I know this this interface is, I feel, a bit challenging. I really, I enjoy giving presentations, but it's mostly because I get to interact with people. So this is a little tough. And and if you were here a few minutes earlier, you'll hear that I don't have my notes present. But um, I'm just going to go for it. Um, we're talking today, uh, I put the name of my talk is The Eagle Has Landed. Montana unleaded and if you read the kind of abstract for the talk today, um, we're going to be talking about um, kind of some of the research we've done here in Montana and kind of the, the social movement to kind of urge hunters uh, to have less lead left on the landscape that can affect uh, things like this eagle here. So, let me see. Not letting me advance. Ooh. Okay, we'll see. I, I'm just going to go with this. Um, this is our kind of outline of what's happening today. I'll give you a little background on the MPG Ranch, which is where I work. And Raptor View Research Institute is um, one of the nonprofits we work with on this Eagle stuff. And um, I'll summarize some of the Eagle research and our key findings. Um, a couple of the spinoff projects that really helped uh, with non the non lead conversation. So things we weren't actually anticipating uh, doing, but ended up having a wonderful effect on our ability to uh, work with hunters and affect social change. And then summarize some of our accomplishments and what I see as a major path to success on the non lead front. And for those of you um, that are hunters and are looking for lots of specific information about performance and ballistics availability, um, you know, there's a lot of material to cover that I could cover today. There's really like three or four presentations worth of material. Um, we're going to have Mike McTee, who is a colleague of mine, follow up with you guys in the student chapter of TWS and um, hopefully do a presentation that's geared just towards hunters. Because um, there's always a lot of questions and I'm not a hunter, so I'm not the best person to answer them. So, yay, Mike. Um, I work on the MPG ranch as an ecologist. I uh, got my master's in forestry here at the University of Montana studying snowshoe hares. And after a lot of work on and off with the Forest Service and other research entities um, and lots of writing, I landed at MPG Ranch, um, and as Jess said, I'm, I'm active on several boards, and um, all of that activity and community engagement really played in nicely um, to working on this non-lead initiative. Um, um, like he said, too, I work mostly, I, I'm not an eagle uh, ecologist. This long-eared owl is like the largest kind of raptory thing I work with. Um, but mostly I work with uh, insectivores and, and harmless, I guess, harmless birds. Um, they don't try to attack you um, or they don't cause much damage if they do. Um, so again, I'm not necessarily uh, the person to talk to about eagles either, but um, I am really good or one of my, I guess, skills is connecting people, connecting landscapes uh, and really trying to inspire a sense of wonder with our wildlife. And that also has played in well to this non-lead initiative. Um, our MPG ranch, um, I'm not sure if you guys can see my cursor. I think you maybe can, but it's in western Montana in the Bitter Valley uh, where the star is. We're just south of Missoula, um, but otherwise you could maybe call it a fairly rural area. I'm not sure how rural you guys are, um, but you can see our, our ranch is about 17,000 acres at the north end of this valley, and it's mostly... Um, River bottom, and this is all the private land where people live, and we're surrounded by mountains and wilderness. Um, we are entirely privately funded. It's one gentleman who this is his vision is research and restoration. And um, we do a lot of work towards studying how our restoration activities are affecting um, birds and other wildlife ungulates. Um, that's the main focus of our research, um, but we do do a lot of other things. As you'll hear, this is what the Bitter Valley Bitter Valley looks like. It's it is beautiful. It's a great mix of agriculture. We still have a strong agricultural economy, um, but it also is kind of a feeder area to Missoula. Uh, lots of people commute. Lots of people retire here, and um, we do have a giant GlaxoSmithKline facility. So it's a really interesting mix of all types of people. But it is a fairly, I would say, socially conservative area. Um, 
And um, there are a lot of folks that aren't big fans of the government, um, federal or state government. Yeah, and just in general, socially conservative, particularly compared to Missoula to our north. Um, but why do we study eagles? And um, I, I mean, these pictures are fantastic. So if nothing else happens today, you guys will see some great pictures of eagles and lots of carcasses. Um, well, one of the main reasons why um, eagles are great to study, um, besides just being awesome, is, you know, everyone has an eagle story. Um, most people have had, uh, at least here in Montana, some sort of encounter with an eagle, something to share. Um, something they're excited about. Um, usually when I do Eagle presentations, it's like going into a kindergarten. Everyone raises their hand and just has to tell me something that happened with them in an Eagle. Um, and for us down here, um, bald eagles anyway, seem to be doing really great. We have a, a fantastic breeding population. They've really recovered after um, the decline from DDT. And here's just a few maps of Here's what the bald eagle territories look like in 1980 in Montana, uh, 1995, and then 2011, and that's the last time anyone really mapped their nests. Um, they're no longer monitored. They're off the endangered species list, and we likely have over a thousand nests just in Montana. So that's something people see all the time. They can drive through the Bitter Valley and, and see bald eagles. And we also get these really big numbers of them in the winter. So we know we have more birds here in the winter than just our breeding population. Golden eagles are kind of a different story for us. Um, we're not really as sure about what's going on with their populations. Um, they're kind of hard to study. Um, they're, you know, where they breed, um, they breed at low density. They can be tricky, tricky to find. Um, data from migration counts indicate a decline, uh, particularly with the, the counts to our north, the Peter Sherrington stuff, and, and we've seen the same thing here in Montana. Um, that's kind of the easiest way to assess their population, but it just, it doesn't feel very satisfying the way you might monitor other, other species. We know there's a lot of anthropogenic mortalities, you know, the things like windmills and vehicle collision and energy development and lots of the places they they like to breed or overwinter are having major habitat conversions. And of course, uh, like any species, people are concerned about climate change and golden eagles. Um, for us, you know, we've just had not very great luck finding their nest. It took three years to find this nest. Um, where we are, um, they're mostly nesting in fairly dense conifer forests. They're really sneaky about their nests, um, but every once in a while we do find find the nest. And I just had to throw this in because it's just so adorable. Um, so we do have them breeding here. We don't know much about where they are breeding, though. I think we have found four or five nests. Um, ourselves, but that's not very many, and I'm sure there are more. Um, and like bald eagles, we tend to see more of the goldens in the winter. Um, and so uh, we have we have a sense that there's probably more around uh, than we realize, and we might be getting eagles from elsewhere. So um, we started working with Raptor View Research Institute. Um, that's who Jess has worked for in the past. And they were originally really well known for all of their work with osprey along the Clark Fork River in um, western Montana. It's the largest Superfund site, I think, in the United States, just the whole extent of the Clark Fork. So they did a lot of ecotoxicology work with these osprey. They started doing work with our osprey in the Bitterroot, which is a much cleaner river. And then the other thing Raptor View is known for is their work um, during migration along the Rocky Mountain front. And if you can see that purple star, that is their site at Rogers Pass. Um, it's right along the Rocky Mountain front. Uh, the blue star is where I am in the Bitterroot. And uh, these guys captured, have captured golden eagles for years. They've uh, done counts and um, they really helped identify basically what looks like a golden eagle highway during migration. And, and of course, this information is really great um, for any sort of land use planning, things like uh, wind construction or other things in Montana. Um, but the other thing these guys noted uh, for their eagles on migration is they do generally take blood from all the eagles and they started to notice um, that these birds indeed had varying levels of lead in their system uh, during migration. Um, 
that was kind of an, an odd or, you know, a concerning finding. They were wondering if that was a um, something that was kind of population wide. Our funder was really um, supportive and interested um, in this concept or this question. And so together, MPG Ranch helped fund Raptor View um, to start a uh, study of the eagles overwintering in the Bitterroot, um, golden eagles in particular, and using satellite transmitters to track them. So we'd learn a little bit more about their movement, where they are coming from or going to, but also try um, to test them, test their blood um, for lead or other toxins. So I'm just going to show this release. Because it's beautiful. You can just see those feathered legs, just a really beautiful flyer, and that bird's heading out with its satellite transmitter. And we we often do have field trips or groups who get to witness this. So that's really, um, you know, that can be a life changing experience. It is for almost everyone that gets to see an eagle up close. Um, this project began in uh, 2011, and since then, Raptor View has captured and processed 149 golden eagles, and uh, we we also started adding in bald eagles in the past couple years, 58, and the number in parentheses are the number of birds that have gotten satellite transmitters, so 62 goldens and 11 balds. That's a huge, huge sample size. Um, Rob, who is the um, executive director, Rob Dominich of Raptor View, um, thinks that these are this is the most uh, golden eagle golden eagles ever captured in one location ever in the world. And again, these birds are overwintering, um, so they're not necessarily ours um, all the time, but they are overwintering. Um, and so the the adult goldens get satellite transmitters. You can see this bald, this adult bald here in addition to a transmitter also gets a colored leg band and um, that helps with id and then um, immature goldens get these wing tags they're kind of like cattle tags and they have have numbers that are really helpful um, for reciting and the key findings from uh, the transmitter i'll kind of divide this into two sections the findings on movements and the findings on lead um, most of these eagles that are overwintering in our valley uh, breed way, way far to the north, and I'll show you a map in a bit here. Um, but the other cool thing is that I have really high site fidelity uh, to their breeding grounds, to their migration routes, and to where they overwinter. So these birds, even though they're they're migrating and breeding to the north, they come back uh, to the Bitter Valley of all places. Um, year after year, and to me, that's a super cool finding because that means that um, these here's some of the tracks here. The red dots are golden eagles, and uh, I didn't have the actual locations uh, tracks for balds, um, um, but I put their kind of nesting territories in here in blue. And then I think this is approximately where you guys are, so you're not too far, and I'm down here where these other balds are. Um, what that shows me and what we try to communicate to people is just like how amazing is it that we are connected by these birds um, to such distant places, um, places that we can't even imagine. And these birds come back to us year after year and the real message we try to get out to folks is, uh, you know, it's up to us as to be stewards for these birds when they're doing their thing back and forth. Um, of the birds, though, we have more of the bald eagles kind of stick around in our area than goldens, but almost all the goldens do take off. Okay, Let's see, but what about these marked eagles? So again, you know, they, they have put transmitters on a, a really awesome amount of birds, but then there's all of these other ones with auxiliary markers. And it is useful or really nice to recite these birds because it gives you um, evidence of their survival and maturity and, and their coming back. And um, so Eric Rasmussen and I from MPG, uh, we started to implement a basically a game camera project where in beginning of the winter of 2016, we put out an array of trail cams all over the Bitter Valley. Um, we used deer carcasses that were roadkill. We had permits to do that. And we had to engage and interact with, I think, 
over 30 landowners by the end of this. Um, we had huge interest in support. We were very surprised. A lot of these were um, cattle ranches, agricultural areas, perhaps places you might suspect folks wouldn't be that thrilled to have a big dead deer set out on their property that might attract any number of scavengers. Um, but people got really into it and we were, it was to the point where we were having to turn people away and we were getting all these alerts for dead deer and it kind of got a little bit out of control, but in, in a fun way. And resightings, yes, we actually for the project have an over 60% resighting rate for marked birds and that is pretty much unheard of. You, anyone that bans birds, you guys all know. Um, you're lucky to get uh, a 2% or 10% resighting rate. And, and when you get that, for the most part, the birds are dead. Um, you know, maybe a, they had a vehicle collision or whatever. So to get an over 60% resighting rate is just fantastic. And um, the other thing it allows us to do, again, we can track these birds over time as they mature. We kind of know what their baseline was when we worked with them or captured them. And we can also study things like, um, we've done an analysis now, how long, because these birds are marked, um, you know, how long are they hanging out at these carcass stations that we have? And indeed we've found for our marked birds, most of them visit for less than a day and maybe only a couple of hours are they actually feeding. And so we have some really good evidence that they're well um, evolved or adapted to ephemeral food sources and, and scavenging in the winter. So putting these carcasses out isn't creating a, you know, some sort of crazy baiting um, situation and habituating them to um, food. They really come, they eat and they move on. Also, lots of other great wildlife. This is a beautiful wolf. Um, you know, things like this uh, got us in con uh, connection with our state agency, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. We gave them some really valuable information on wolf packs that they didn't already have. And then we got some cool things like this beautiful mountain lion. Uh, we ended up setting up a hair snare for this lion and it's uh, and collecting scat. And so its DNA and the scat are part of a larger mountain lion study now. And we also just saw some cool things. I I don't know. I know it's kind of not the thing to say, but I do love cats as a bird biologist. It's just wrong, but I love cats wild and domestic. And so it's kind of fun to see uh, this bobcat and this coyote kind of uh, hanging out together and sharing a meal. And then we did also document zombie cows and the bitterroot. Um, these sorts of things did happen. People's horses or cows would, would show up at night. Um, so lots of zombies around. Um, but the great thing is the landowners were super into it. You know, you'd pull up with a dead deer and they'd want to pull it to the site. Uh, they just really jumped right in and showed a lot of pride in both the project and the wildlife that they were harboring. And, uh, you know, things like cows die, things like horses die. And uh, they were just ready to have it set out and put a camera on it to see eagles and other wildlife. Uh, we got really popular. We started getting all of these requests to do talks about eagles, talks about scavengers. Um, this is me giving a talk for the University of Montana for their lifelong learning program. So you can see a lot of a lot of gray hair in the audience. But you know, these people are super enthusiastic. They have time, they have resources, and they really want to jump right in um, to conservation. They have a lot of friends. Uh, we also had this scavenger roadshow. I know this is a horrible picture, but I just, it's so funny to me. We printed some of our photos on canvas and, and it kind of moved around from place to place. This is the, the roadshow at the Blacksmith Brewery. So people in, in Stevensville, people are like hanging out, drinking beer, bands playing. And there's a bunch of carcass photography in the background. And uh, right now, all of those pictures are at a bank. So the bank in Stevensville wanted the art they called it art and it's been on the wall there for over a year. Um, we also have over 6,000 people classifying our imagery. So if, if any of you ever get bored and want to look at trail, trail cams, uh, basically we have it on the Zooniverse platform. It's a citizen science crowd kind of crowdfunding data processing site. There's so many cool projects. You can help us tag our imagery and uh, tag the scavengers and it's there under Western Montana Wildlife. But that's another outlet for us. Again, 6,000 people there from all over the world 
and we have ways to kind of send them newsletters and send them info about the project. So this parallel project, even though it's not directly related to lead, um, does give us great data on eagles and other wildlife and those connections with other biologists and some of our other colleagues. Really, we developed so many relationships and a sense of investment from other landowners and uh, just the public, you know, our names are out there. People know who we are and the citizens themselves are doing all these little spin off projects they've designed. There's a lot of photographers um, that really like this stuff. And now they do things like monitor eagles and calving, you know, how many bald eagles are hanging around calves like this. They also do nest searching and monitoring. And again, that outreach potential, we developed a really huge network um, with this project. But again, this is the heart of kind of what I wanted to talk about, our other key finding. And, um, you know, and it's kind of a bummer um, if you frame it that way. Most of the golden and bald eagles that overwinter here have some level of lead in their blood. And, um, you know, we didn't understand the the scale of the issue at first um but rob and crew over time it just kept accumulating data and so this is a paper that just came out in early 2021 and it the sample size is 91 golden eagles and close to 95 percent of them had elevated levels with eight considered above clinical so um i put this little red line in here to just differentiate those that are at background level, so it's less than 10 micrograms per deciliter is kind of considered background. And then all of these other birds are um, at some level of exposure. And here's the clinical and acute is a, you know, severely poisoned. And since this paper came out or since, you know, they wrote this manuscript, they've added another 58 golden eagles to the sample. And um, now they're up to 96% of them testing above background for lead exposure. Um, here's just another figure. It's kind of the same goldens, but um, they've added the balds in here too. And when you combine those two, actually the balds tend to not have as much lead poisoning as the goldens. So these this pool together, I think is closer to 94, 92% of the birds um, are somewhat compromised. And so, um, you know, what does that mean? We could talk about this all day and there's probably better people to talk about the physiology. We all know lead is bad. It's a poison. Um, but clearly there's a lot of eagles out there that are surviving with, with it in their blood and they're compromised to some extent, but we don't always know. We don't, we don't always know how badly um, they're compromised, of course, until we find them in the very clinical or, um, you know, tragic state of acute poisoning. Um, I kind of liken it, though, to, um, you know, if you were driving, you know, back and forth to work or to school, but you were wearing your grandma's glasses, um, you could think of if it's some you'd probably make it most of the time driving, but you, you'd have impairments that would increase your risk of many other things happening. So for something like a golden eagle, that perhaps um, its reaction time gets slowed down, it doesn't have the sens senses that it used to, it's not as um, able to hunt, at some point there's gonna be something that happens to it um, as a result of that impairment. And then the other thing just to point out, when lead is detected in the blood, it generally uh, correlates to recent exposure. So something that it ingested in the past approximately two weeks, and then it gets kind of accumulated um, in other systems in the body. So we know that those birds, we know eagles can travel hundreds of miles even in a day, but in general, they're moving around the Bitterroot Valley. So whatever they're um, ingesting is somewhat local. And at the same time that this is all happening, uh, you know, for us capturing birds that are actively scavenging, of course, our rehabbers um, are getting golden eagles in to rehab. These are two, both, both of these birds came in early this winter, I think in January, and both of them didn't make it. So the one on the right um, was picked up by a hunter, and I'll talk more about this bird later. Um, but it was just laying in the woods and it was acutely poisoned. Uh, the one on the left was actually a raptor view bird. It had had a transmitter for about a year. It was actually a local bird 
it ripped its transmitter off. We hadn't seen it for years and it was recaptured by the Raptor View crew um, with really high levels of lead. And it also had an injury to a foot consistent with being caught in a leg hold trap and that got infected. And so that both of these birds ended up dying. Um, Brooke at Wild Skies did try chelation therapy, which is an option sometimes, but uh, neither, neither of these birds made it. And, you know, the one on the left, I'm not sure what it died from, you know, the lead certainly couldn't have helped um, while it was fighting an infection. So that's just kind of a bummer. Um, and of course, the, the question is, where is it coming from? And we know there's lots of research on this, and I'll show you some links that you guys can follow. Um, that that what these birds are doing is they're scavenging on on things that are left out in the woods. And for us here in Western Montana, it is the the gut piles and other remains of um, large mammals uh, like elk and deer um, that are either left in the field or people are dumping. And our Fish and Wildlife Service estimates hunters are leaving 1.5 billion pounds of carrion in the field every year. And, um, you know, if they've used lead ammunition to, to kill that or dispatch that animal, then it's, um, it is full of lead fragments. Um, this is just a resource. If you are curious, again, you know, I'm not giving this, this topic justice. Um, huntingwithnonlead.org is a, is a website to go to that contains lots of info on ammo and the science and demonstrations. And then Mike McTee, of course, will take a ton of time to go through this stuff with people if you're interested. Um, but there's so many papers now showing about showing not only um, what the source of this uh, lead is and but also the effects it's having on wildlife. Um, and but for those of you that aren't hunters or just aren't that familiar, um, so the, you know the ammunition. If you're using lead um, for big game hunting, lead can fragment depending on your bullet. You know, ten to twenty five percent of its mass fragments on impact. It does not have to hit bone. It's just hitting tissue. And in a lot of cases, these fragments are too small um, or could be too small to even be perceived. You know, many hunters are very surprised to know that the bullets they use are producing these fragments. Um, they can spread 18 to 24 inches away from the wound channel. So it's not just the, the place where the shot was taken. Um, here's another one, another deer, uh, and you can see the lead fragments just lighting up all through it. Um, we don't always see them in, uh, of course, we're not x-raying the eagles that are alive, uh, but this is another eagle. This was one of Rob's eagles that was captured this winter, and you can actually see the, the lead fragments in its digestive system. And for whatever reason, physiologically, um, the way these large raptors work, they're just really susceptible to the poisoning in a way that's not actually seen um, in the digestive systems of mammals uh, to the same extent. Uh, but here's this bird. This is the same bird. You can see the lead. Uh, Rob captured it, I think, in uh, January. It flew around. It had high lead at the time, but it seemed functional. And then about a month later, uh, the points just started stacking up. So he went out and found it. It was maybe like 40 miles away from Missoula. And when he turned it over, he suspected lead poisoning right away. It's got clenched talons, and you can see um, the scutes are uh, a color that indicates poisoning. Um, and pretty much at this point, at this stage in time, when rehabbers or other people uh, find an injured eagle, if it hasn't been like hit by a car, but seems compromised, um, you can pretty much assume that <laughs> lead is involved somehow. And um, almost all, all the rehabbers, at least in Montana, now test uh, for lead in their blood sampling. So yeah, this seemed like a huge, uh, wow, like 90 some percent. Um, and again, we didn't know the number was gonna be that high early on, but um, to see that happening with the birds uh, that we work with, um, just was, it just meant we had to do, we wanted to do something. Uh, we wanted to work with folks and see if we couldn't make a change um, and try to suggest um, using alternatives because they are out there. Um, this things just started to pile up um, again. Here's like my metaphor for both what we were learning, but also the kind of the actions that we could take um, the paths we could take to try to work with folks um, for education and outreach on this topic.
So Raptor View um, continued to accumulate data. In fact, you know, they're still going even well this winter, they're done for the season, but even now in 2021, they've continued capturing eagles. Um, we added kind of this topic of edle education, led education to every outreach talk we were doing. Uh, Raptor View works with a lot of high school students and other kids. They're not necessarily hunters, um, but we added the message there. Um, as a property, and if anyone's out there, if you manage a property, um, we do a lot of hunting here. Um, we have a really nice youth hunt program where kids come for two days and have to learn everything about being an ethical hunter. Uh, we require um, the use of non lead ammo on our property and we cur encourage other private landowners to do the same thing. And uh, these kids have to learn about it and learn about the effects. Um, but that's one thing, even if you're not a hunter, um, but you manage your own a large property and let people hunt there, um, that's one thing you can do. You can require non lead ammo. For us, we have the ability to provide it for people if they, um, they think cost is a barrier, and we even provide them the ammo and the gun uh, to shoot it with if, if that's what's necessary. Um, but really, uh, you know, most of the audience that I usually present to think about, like your Audubon or, or whatever citizens groups, uh, they're not hunters. Uh, we really need to work with hunters directly and, of course, the state agencies that work with them. And for us, again, that's Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks is our state agency. Um, these are really tough. Um, this is a tough issue because um, there have to be culture shifts um, need to occur here. This is social science. This is not like this is not the realm any of us are trained uh, to to be in uh, to know how to to work socially. Uh, we need to needed to connect with hunters in a way that um, made them feel like they should evaluate inward um, and maybe think about a change. And we also needed to convince the agencies that it was safe to take leadership on the issue. And again, I'm not that familiar with how your uh, wildlife management agencies work, but here ours has a lot of great people that work for it. Um, but they they get beat down by the general public for just about anything they do, any decision they make. And our legislature here, um, you know, we're in the middle of a legislative session, and it's happened. It happens every year, every time they're in session. They are just passing bill after bill that takes the power and decision making about wildlife and out of the hands of the managers and um, limits them financially. There's always this threat kind of of um, their power is going to be taken away. So it's really tough for the agency to take a stand on anything that's controversial, even if there's science and evidence to support that maybe a change should be made. Um, I'm and also I'm not a hunter. I like to dress in camo. Um, for some of my work, it's kind of necessary. It wasn't really necessary for this. This is us uh, pygmy owl surveillance crew, um, and we all dressed up in camo. But um, hunting is a very prevalent uh, culture here in Montana. I mean, I don't hunt, but I go out with people that hunt. Um, I support it. I, you know, I think it's a great way to feed yourself. And so we are lucky in that it's not. Um, it's not something that is, I don't know, radical or unfamiliar to people. Um, half my friends are hunters and well, I should say more than half. And, and again, it's not an exclusive category either. Um, you know, you can be a birder and you can be a hunter and you can be, you know, whatever and be a hunter. So it's not like you're in one box or another box. Um, and lots of people here are, and we also had great precedent on this topic in other states and with other organizations. And the folks that Rob has worked with in the past, um, Brian Bedrosian, who was at Craighead Beringia South and, and now is at Teton Raptor Center out of Jackson and Wyoming, he did some of the first research um, that really brought this to light. The graph on the bottom here is looking at the lead levels of ravens around Jackson Hole. And again, remember, when blood is tested for lead, it's indicating very recent exposure. And so you can see Brian's data kind of showing how the lead levels in ravens increased uh, right around the hunting season and then decreased. There was a little bump during snow melt, just like we see here in Montana, when the snow melts and all the carcasses and things that have been dumped uh, kind of melts out of the snow, there's a little pulse of lead exposure again. Um, and again, the folks at huntingwithnonlead.org have been working on this, and they are kind of 
affiliated now where the, what we have now going is the North American Non-Lead Partnership. And that's mostly led by Chris Parrish, who, for those of you who are familiar with uh, California Condor work, um, he's through the Peregrine Fund. He's leading that with Leland Brown from the Oregon Zoo. All of these are, men, well, men uh, for the most part. They're all avid hunters and they all really know their stuff and are doing really great research, um, both on the hunting side and, and the wildlife side. So we were really lucky to have them kind of blaze the trail for us in states like Wyoming and California a bit. But when we tried, I mean, again, we're trying to talk to people in our community and it was really tough at first. Um, I, it's, I guess it, for me, it kind of felt like maybe going out on a, on a first date, like kind of awkward and tentative and you're like, okay, how are you reacting and how am I reacting? Um, we started out with going to like a really super local um, uh, wildlife group, which for, for me is the River Valley County Fish and Wildlife. You know, it's a stereotypical kind of rod and gun club or um, hook and bullet club, I guess is what you might call it mostly older folks and have been around a long time. But I knew some of the people there and they let me come and um, talk. And um, at first tried, I tried to really just focus on the eagles and the eagle ecology and just kind of sprinkle the lead in. Um, but they were just blown away, fascinated, and some were not, were way not into it. And that's the kind of the same thing we found too. Um, this is, you know, back in 20, maybe 14, 15, 16. If you would go onto any social media site, like a hunting group and, and say something about lead, you just kind of get slammed. And I'm not sure what my next, yeah. I'm just trying to, since I don't have my notes, I can't remember how I was gonna say this, but um, we would just get slammed by certain people. So, we would get these, um, and I think Jess, this is kind of like what you saw when you were looking at some of the hunter sites. You'll get a lot of rhetoric, um, at least for us down here um, in the United States, uh, people are extremely concerned about this being a slippery slope to gun control. So anytime you talk about things like ammunition, um, that there's some kind of conspiracy by the envirers or greenies to take my gun away, and so that's a huge barrier for us because as soon as people start getting worried about uh, their gun rights, um, every, you know, hackles come up and it, it just um, it just kind of sucks. But the other thing we get too is just kind of there was the disbelief. You know, I've been hunting with lead for years. I've never seen fragments. I've never had a problem. I've never seen it. And then also kind of the deflection of. Well, it can't be from uh, bullets. It must be from lead paint. It must be from them drinking water. It must be from all of these other things, car batteries. Um, and then the deflection of, well, so many eagles are killed by wind turbines and so many eagles are you know, killed by vehicles and we should be worrying about that more. And so at first that was really the kind of the pushback um, that we were getting. And, um, you know, I wasn't always, I didn't always know how to answer those questions or how to field it. Luckily, you know, again, these folks were kind enough, these, the men in the group I went to, to just kind of like talk it out and have discussions. And uh, again, me admitting, gosh, I don't really know. You tell me, like, what's your experience? But again, focus on this, um, trying to bring it back to the Eagles, which again is what I know a little bit more about is that you know we really have a, a responsibility like to do right by them these are birds like we're affecting huge populations of birds like across the entire continent and hemisphere and um you know hopefully you you would care about that um and again this is really to remind people you know so this is kind of these are some of the talking points we developed over time that this is a problem with a super easy solution, right? If you think about all the other challenges that eagles or other wildlife face, you know, huge habitat conversion, like climate change, like what am I gonna do about that? This problem is one that every hunter 
um, has the ability um, to help with both in what they do with their, uh, you know, what their choices are and then what they maybe would advocate to their friends um, and their peer group. And so, you know, kind of couching this in terms of this is a problem with an actually super easy solution and you can help, I think was really, um, people really responded to that. Um, you know, one of the other complaints is always about cost and availability. And, um, you know, putting that in perspective too, you know, if you shoot really cheap lead bullets, then you are never gonna find a, a copper bullet um, that's gonna be that cheap. Um, but when you think about what people spend on hunting, I don't know what folks spend on hunting where you guys are, but you got the fancy pants, you got the case of beer, you got the gas. Um, really, if you're only taking a couple shots a year, um, the cost of the ammo is just not that much of the cost of hunting. Um, and of course, as we are seeing more demand for copper, um, there are many, many more options for people, even though I'm, you know, ammunition in general is just really limited down here right now. Um, but if you're shooting high performing lead, then you probably aren't that far off on your price point for copper. Um, but again, just putting that in perspective, like what's a case of beer, you know, to you and what's a, you know, what's a copper bullet? Um, this is when, you know, I don't, I don't stress this one too much, but some of the folks that are hunters and do outreach to, um, you know, we live in a, in a world and a culture where decisions are made about hunting by non hunters, you know, for better or worse, um, that's just what ends up happening. And so if you're concerned about the future of hunting, I know a lot of people here, are, you know, looking at hunter numbers, they're thinking they're going down. Um, you really want the general public to think this is a, something that's okay for people to do. And so, um, you know, we don't want people thinking that hunters are poisoning scavengers. What we want people to think is that hunters are feeding scavengers or helping scavengers or, you know, or something like that. Um, and then the other key thing is, you know, I found with my local group too, um, they, there were a handful of folks already using copper. They were using copper from a performance perspective. They weren't necessarily thinking about lead fragments, um, but they had experience with its performance. And that's also another big kind of pushback we get from people is they just, they, they either had experience with copper maybe 20 years ago, or they just actually haven't literally shot with it. And again, um, having someone you know that's like in your peer group, that's maybe a mentor, or just, you know, your buddy um, that has experience with using the copper that you can talk to um, is just a great way to get the messaging across. And so, you know, we just would find when we were doing outreach, you know, we'd ask people to raise their hand if they had experience with copper and then just say, you know, when you're having beers later, you know, go talk to Gary and, and have him tell you how it worked. Um, it's much better for them to get that message that this performs well um, from a friend than say from me. Um, and again, we we provided people, we provide people with all sorts of data information, but again, it just never beats uh, direct experience. People just don't believe um, that their their bullets fragment. And so um, Mike has hosted several of these and we've had quite a few of these shooting events. Um, where people can shoot or see a demo of what happens. So you're basically shooting into these water jugs and then draining so people can see the comparison between what they would shoot and what a copper bullet does. And they can literally see, you know, they can literally drain the water and see all of the fragments. And it, just like holding an eagle, um, seeing this directly in first hand is like a life changing experience or behavior changing experience for many people. Um, we had this great, um, this is, I think, really the start for us of some of our fantastic relationships with some of our other local hunting and conservation groups is Chris Parrish and Leland Brown helped help us set up a, um, a day at the range in Missoula and uh, under the banner of the North American Non-Lead Partnership. And we got buy-in and support from another local group, Hellgate Hunters and Anglers and our Montana and National Wildlife Federation and then MPG Ranch threw in some funds to help make this happen. And I think we had over 50 hunters come and we made it, you know, kind of like a weekend event. We had a little pint night and uh, hangout, lots of coffee, beer. We raffled off a hunt. Um, so we gave people some incentives and 
we had this wonderful time and all of these hunters got to see uh, uh, some of them were actually the shooters in this demo. And um, I really think we changed we changed some minds. Um, we don't bring up this fact too much um, because we kind of leave it to hunters to make the connection here. But remember, if this these lead fragments are in the gut piles in the woods, they're also in the meat you're bringing home. And there's not a lot of great research to to talk about the effects of this particular lead exposure in people. I mean, it's just not something that's super easy to study. There have definitely been studies that can, you know, scan game meat um, donated to food banks or other places and it's it is full of lead but how that's affecting people we really don't know but when people see the um that visual of um just all the fragments and think about that they're feeding that to their kids or family that's another um i think that's just another um behavioral uh, just a shift point for folks thinking about um, what they're feeding to themselves and their families but we don't usually, or I don't usually stress the human part. I think uh, hunters are just uh, smart enough. They make the connection themselves. So we started working with all these hunters, um, but the other part of this is how do we convince the agencies to take this topic on? Because, you know, really they're the ones that should be showing leadership on this. And this is a little bit of a joke um, slide, you know, that, but the thought being, if you can somehow relate what's going on with the eagles and lead to elk <laughs> or something else that people hunt, then our agency will spend some time working on it. Um, and that's, you know, that's not to say that agency folks don't know this or aren't aware. Um, but they really are in a uh, a tough position, you know, again, taking a stand on anything that's a bit controversial or has to do with guns is just hard for them. So we went the kind of professional route. Uh, we used the shield of this professional organization, which I think some of you are members of, the Wildlife Society, and pointed out they have a very um, really nice position statement. I, I suggest all of you Google it, their position statement on lead and ammo and fishing tackle and all of its effects and really advocate for not using it. And so we used, um, we we had a TWS, our Montana TWS conference, um, I think it was in 2014 or 15, where I had a, I got like a kit from the hunting with non-lead people and we put up a booth and we went in front of our board and basically we're able to start some conversations with folks um, as members of TWS, not necessarily as employees of our uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. And that started to get the ball rolling kind of behind the scenes. So we were talking about this under the banner of our professional organization and not our um, employment. And, um, you know, after some of those initial conversations, then people started chatting, you know, over the phone or however they could to um, kind of offer support. But it was made very clear to us at the time that the agency would not be taking this on and would not be discussing it or, you know, publicizing anything about it. So we decided to try to show them it, it became clear that if we could demonstrate that hunters were actually active and interested and um, on board with with non lead education or just um, basically showing the agency that they cared about wildlife beyond just harvesting it, that that could be a good way, um, a good just entry point in with the agency. Um, to make them feel like it was safe to take the topic on. So Mike McTee and I came up with this other project. Everyone loves game cameras, right? You go to certain places and there's just game cameras everywhere. So, um, you know, we always were curious. Mike was always curious about what comes to his gut pile when he leaves it in the woods. So basically our idea was to see if any hunters wanted to take a camera with them when they hunted and then after they harvested their animal put a game cam on it just to record what came and again this this project was not explicitly about lead uh, we very deliberately avoided the lead topic altogether and wanted this project just to very simply show what scavengers come uh, to what you're leaving in the field and um we never brought the lead, I don't think we brought the lead topic up at all. We asked people kind of what they use to harvest with, um, but we didn't like a, you know, a gun versus archery, but um, but that was it. So we were being very careful just 
we're not talking about lead, we're talking about scavengers. And um, this is the kind of the talk um, I came up with on this. I know that gut, that gut pile is really bloated. Um, but yeah, the love triangles caught on camera. So the goal here is just to demonstrate that, you know, hunters are interested in this. Um, they're definitely, you know, attracting and feeding scavengers when they leave stuff in the woods and kind of what what is this relationship like? And of course we did, we got fantastic eagle footage. I think this was a hunter, he was in Colorado. We had people from all over doing this, mostly in the West, mostly in Montana. He had up to six golden eagles on his uh, gut pile. We did get a marked, you know, we got, actually, I think we got three of our marked eagles on gut piles that were kind of in the Bitterroot, Missoula areas. And then there's a little kitty because I like cats, um, but all kinds of things. There's a bear with cubs. Again, this shows the full range of what is taking advantage of what hunters leave in the woods. And I think, let's see if this will show. I think I've got a movie. This is a great time lapse. Um, this was up in, the, I think, the rattlesnake wilderness north of Missoula. So this actually, an entire wolf pack came. This was an elk uh, from an elk harvest. Just super cool. All the magpies, the wolves. A golden eagle comes in here. But you can imagine how excited uh, the hunters were to see their um, stuff. We kept their uh, locations anonymous so that we weren't disclosing, you know, private hunting areas. And we offered to retrieve the cameras, but a lot of the hunters wanted to retrieve it themselves, not, not because they were worried about us going in there, but um, because it gave them an excuse to go back to the place um, and just see it again. So. Um, the other cool thing we we noticed, you know, that sometimes the cameras were out for weeks or months um, before someone would, could retrieve it, is how much was going on around the gut pile site, even when there was no longer um, material there. That's really cool. It kind of the, the, the life of the gut pile goes on kind of socially much longer than there's food. You know, things are, you know, animals are scent marking and they're investigating um, for months. Um, and then the other cool thing thing well, or not cool that kind of relates to that too is that the we have lots of um, instances of ungulates coming in to visit the gut piles and the areas where the gut piles were and we see that too in our other winter eagle project um, and you guys might know you know with chronic wasting disease this is just a really interesting phenomenon uh, to think about is that these gut piles being left in the woods if they do contain uh, prions or chronic wasting disease um, they are something that ungulates are visiting and kind of nosing around and having contact with. So that was just kind of a cool side finding. Um, but really, we had hunters that just were super into this. Um, some of them have participated now for three or four winters. And we were also a little strategic in who we invited or we made some direct contact with folks. So Missoula has a lot of um, it's the headquarters for quite a few uh, kind of hunting conservation organizations, um, including Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, Boone and Crockett, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. We uh, kind of, you know, worked it with a bunch of folks from those different offices or headquarters and got quite a few of them involved in this project. And again, that we used that as a bridge to meet people, to just talk about scavengers and just talk about hunting and stuff. And that really led to the great relationships um, that led to several of those people really jumping on board with the non-lead um, education. So um, basically, I guess I'll just go through some of the things we've accomplished. Um, so, and at this point, remember, we've accumulated a lot of data, we've made a lot of contacts, and now we have folks from a bunch of organizations that are kind of aware and kind of all doing um, their own things that are all contributing basically to moving that needle of like, oh, you know, let's non-lead is a scary topic. I'm not sure about that. I have no experience to now it's like, Oh, that's just a given, you know, lead is out there. We should try to get rid of it and let's do something about it. So Raptor View continues to do their great research, um, continuing to capture eagles, test eagles, um, and they've expanded some of their work now to turkey vultures, um, but just looking at some of the other scavengers that might be affected by lead. 
Um, we are still working with so many of our landowners. So these are folks that either maybe hosted a carcass camera, you know, or something else. And um, they're continuing to be involved and engaged. And not only on this, but now they're on all sorts of our other little science projects on their properties. And these folks, um, you know, if they allow hunting, do not allow people to use lead um, on their property. Um, where are we at with agencies and hunters? Uh, I had to throw MC Hammer in there, and I guess that probably dates me a little bit, but we have gone from a like can't touch this or don't touch this um, scenario to um, it really just being normal conversation. It's not like a big deal to talk about copper ammo. It's not a big deal to talk about eagles, lead poisoning, gut piles. And we're not exactly like shouting from the mountains, but um, we can just freely talk about this and there's no more, um, I don't know, it's just not a big deal. Um, and I think normalizing that conversation is, is one of our biggest accomplishments. Um, in terms of the agency, um, we had tried for years. Um, they have their own kind of, you know, nice glossy publication, Montana Outdoors. Try to have them have an article on this uh, for years and we're shut down, shut down, shut down. And in 2020, um, they did a giant article on choosing the unleaded option. So again, this is um, writing by Tom Dixon, who works for Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. This is our agency um, publicizing the issue and, and advocating um, and giving people information on this topic. This is for us a huge deal. Um, Fish, Wildlife and Parks also added, I think I put it even in here, here it is. Um, in the hunting regulations now uh, to know the facts about lead. Again, this is huge uh, to go from not wanting to talk about it at all to putting it in the actual hunting regs. And again, um, this is the other thing I, I forgot to say. We um, are advocating for voluntary switches to a non lead ammo. We are very much not advocating for legislation. So we really want people to make this choice for themselves. We don't want the government telling them uh, or telling people how they have to do it. That provides just too much pushback. We know. Um, from what happened in California, where they've legislated that um, and and have the California condor. Um, people here are always, um, they never want to do what California does. And when you talk about legislation, it's, it's, a, it's a non starter. So, um, like these regulations say, uh, we want people to make the choice. We want to feel, uh, want them to feel empowered that they can make a choice. So FWP put that in their regs, um, and they also have it in their pamphlets on prairie dog shooting. Um, our Montana Master Hunter Program added non-lead curriculum um, to what they teach for master hunters. And um, we put on, uh, Mike McTee and I advertised and put on a non-lead workshop at the 2020 Montana TWS that happened just before COVID. So we were able to get together and I think we had 90 people sign up and we basically just had a hangout, uh, kind of just a, a hangout session to see or hear where people were at, what they were interested in, what their questions were and what we could all do as a group. And that was probably 50% Fish, Wildlife and Parks employees at that thing, but a lot, a lot of other cool partners as well. This has been kind of fun. I mean, I don't like to get sucked into social media, particularly on sites that I really uh, am not part of the, the group, like hunter groups, but I like to watch them. Um, hunting magazines and newspapers now are running lots of stories about lead poisoning. So Mike T has spent years kind of peddling, um, you know, pitching uh, articles to all of these magazines and was just getting nowhere. And now it's pretty common to see articles on advocating for non-lead and Mike is just on a roll with writing and getting stuff out there. Um, for us, what's been huge is we have some really motivated individuals, um, particularly in our local Montana chapter of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers and also Montana Wildlife Federation that have just like, they have just rocked this. They go on their local sites and also on the national BHA site and uh, you can see the one on the left um, basically saying, hey, you know, it's I don't want to poison scavengers. I know lead fragments, so I use copper. And I'm just curious if the rest of you can share, you know, your harvest success and stories. 
And um, I, I mean, these just go on and on uh, folks basically advocating to each other uh, what they're doing. And um, there is still, there will always be um, these people that um, have some comments about how this isn't important this isn't real this isn't happening and what's great now is i can just kind of like watch the sites and i don't have to say a word uh the hunters um come back with great discussion points it's not like i have to correct anyone about uh, lead paint you know or whatever this is all being um kind of corralled from within the organizations which is what exactly what you want um, this North American non lead partnership is really taking off. Here's Chris Parrish, uh, Peregrine Fund, and Leland Brown. Um, we've got BHA is on board now. I mean, I remember meeting with them a very long time ago, and they just were very tentative. Um, and I'm not faulting or criticizing them. It's just the way the culture was at the time. Um, they were very tentative to let us do anything about lead. They were very welcoming for us to table or do stuff about eagles or scavengers, but not to take on lead. Um, now uh, they are all over it. Um, our local chapter is all over it. And again, Montana Wildlife Federation has even come up with this non lead pledge that you can just pledge, you know, and, and get some sort of recognition. Um, huge for us, Boone and Crockett put out a position statement. They're kind of known for being a fairly conservative uh, organization. Um, but we had a bunch of their staff participate in our hunter uh, game cam thing, and that just started a dialogue um, with some of those folks, and uh, they got together and uh, and put out a, a, a cool statement. And then for us to, you know, Meat Eater is huge here. Um, they worked with Federal to brand a line of copper ammunition. And so what we're really seeing here is a, a really cool culture shift, particularly with some of these, um, I would say, more progressive, um, maybe younger, but not always um, groups that are kind of cropping up. There's a whole hunt, you know, to eat um, kind of movement. And now it's actually kind of, it's kind of trendy or, um, and again, I'm not saying that in a bad way, but that's just the way the culture has shifted to be like, I'm using copper and, and it's awesome. This is the one thing we have not reconciled and feel like we need to take on. And it's just a different, um, different game. The um, shooting of, of, well, they call them gophers here, uh, ground squirrels and prairie dogs, because of course this is what's left behind. And Mike McTee has done this really cool um, scavenger game cam study where they shot, you know, gophers, left them out. And uh, just the number of scavengers coming to eat them is really, really astounding. And they are just chock full of lead. Um, you know, 22 ammo is just different. Uh, the people that participate in this, I would hesitate to call uh, gopher and prairie dog shooting hunting. Um, you know, it's just a different demographic. You're not appealing, I think, to ethics in the same way. And we are just slowly, slowly trying to figure out how to work on this. Um, and there just aren't as many non-lead options for this type of shooting as well. Um, okay, I'm wrapping it up, guys. I know there's a lot of slides. Some of the keys to our success. I just thought I'd mention these things because uh, these are the, some of the things that really worked for us or helped uh, be conducive to really moving the needle here. Um, some of these things are not in our control, but chronic wasting disease did pop up in Montana just in the past couple of years. People are really starting to think a lot more about leaving dead stuff um, on the landscape and whether or not we should be doing that from a chronic wasting disease perspective. So that's just kind of upped the um, just the awareness of, of what's left behind and, and particularly for us, illegal dumping of carcasses, which happens, you know, you drive up any rural road here and there's just things dumped all over the place. Um, we've had quite a few very high profile eagle deaths, you know, both in Yellowstone and Glacier National Park, which got a lot of press. And then this is uh, one of the eagles I showed you a picture of earlier, a um, Hannah who is on the board for Montana BHA was just out hiking with her husband and found this eagle. And um, she's taken it on as a, as a bit of a mission and writing about it in um, lots of different hunting um, avenues. But her language is really strong. Hunters, this is on us. And again, um, it's wonderful to have hunters actually um, putting these messages out now. You know, there's nothing 
that I, as a biologist and a non hunter have to do. Um, she really, really felt um, felt something with this and and um, and it's been great to even though the, the death is very tragic and sad um, just to have people talking about this. Um, it helps for us that we're private. Um, so MPG is private, Raptor View is private. Uh, sometimes when these messages come from government agencies, again, even working with landowners and some hunters, uh, it's not always the smoothest um, and there's not always great dialogue. So that has been helpful for us to be private entities. Um, we knew we were in it for the long haul on this one. I know that could be hard if you're like a student or, you know, uh, early, early career professional, you know, you may not be in a place for very long. Um, but the kind of um, kind of community and, and relationships that develop over time are really what made this um, kind of happen and kind of work. Um, <laughs> we'll see. I made this kind of uh, this analogy last night while drinking wine and trying to finish this. Uh, we keep repeating the message. And so for us, our message was, you know, yes, lead is bad, but hunters can make a switch and they can do it on their own and we're not going to legislate. And, you know, you just keep saying it over and over again. And um, all my friends know I, I have this obsession with eagles looking like they're wearing pants. So the analogy here is that if you just keep showing people pictures of eagles that look like they're wearing pants, all of you on the audience end of this will be looking now forever in the future. Uh, for eagles wearing pants and even a goshawk wears pants sometimes and this is pants the eagle that got this whole thing started the one on the right um but yeah just keeping your message consistent and clear to the point where it's just normal conversation well now we're stuck on pants okay don't worry about the two percent you know there's always going to be that eagle flying upside down again there's always going to be this guy those guys for us that accuse uh, uh eagles of licking car batteries or something at this point um they're they're just such uh they're they're background noise for us uh there are so many folks that you can have great discussions with and even if you don't change their minds or they don't change your mind you're at least having a constructive dialogue and you know the other folks we just don't worry about anymore um doing everything with energy and passion um i think just when people see how much we care you care hunters care it really that energy um just pervades uh what we're doing and sometimes makes you do stuff that you'd be you know scared to do otherwise um but that's really telling for people when you're willing to take some risks and are, um, you know, just put it out there. Um, we did things like uh, we just always tried to have fun, be laughing. Uh, we wore these outfits when we were working with dead deer. So we looked super official in our eagle jumpsuits um, and people really like that. But again, community engagement is super important. And again, that might be hard if you're a student or you know at a university and you're not sure how long you're going to be um, you're going to be there. But you know, for us, um, this is where people live. This is their homes, and so you know, connecting with them, uh, showing them what we do, showing them why it's important and why they are important was a huge um, reason why all of this is successful. And that is I think my 110th slide. I just need to thank everyone that helped on this um, and all of this work. There are tons of people doing non-lead outreach and education, and this is just my uh, sharing and other people might see what's been happening a different way, but just know lots of folks are working on this and lots of folks are out there to help if you are interested in kind of exploring this concept or um, trying to, to promote it, you know, where you live and in what you do. So just here's a couple places you can check for more research or, you know, information about what we do at MPG Ranch. Um, and again, check out the huntingwithnonlead.org and be ready for Mike McTee or whatever Jess and Mike come up with. And I think with that, I will stop talking and take a drink and um, see if you guys have any questions or something you want to discuss. Um, and I'll just stop right there. Hey, and thanks. should I stop sharing? Uh, awesome. No, you can leave your screen up. Thanks, Kate. That was uh, that was fantastic. Um, it looks like most people stuck around for the for the time. So uh, maybe okay. folks do have questions to 
uh, either turn their mics on, they can ask you directly, or they can type it in the chat. And if you can see that chat box, you can just read them directly and kind of answer uh, any questions if folks kind of put them there. Feel free to. And I'm, I'm curious if how many of you folks are hunters or if this is new information. Um, I don't know. I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, sometimes it takes a little bit of time for messages to pop up in the chat. Um, but I'm going to check that out. Yeah, for folks who are still here, uh, if you have any questions for Kate, you can ask them now. But as she mentioned, we're try we're we're planning to put a talk together with the Saskatchewan chapter of the Wildlife Society to invite Mike McTee to speak more directly um, on the yeah the hunter kind of side of of this topic. So if you follow any of any of the social media pages for the SKTWS, that will hopefully. Um, manifest uh, later this year. I have a question, Kate. Okay, hi. Um, so I have interacted with people who, when they're shooting for sport, just like clay shooting or whatever, they still mm -hmm. use lead for that. And when I discuss it with them, their comment is sort of like, oh, well, it's not ending up in a gut pile. It's not ending up in wetlands. So it's probably not going to be a risk to wildlife as much. And I just wondered if you had thoughts about uh, lead ammunition for like sport clay shooting. Sure. Sure. So, you know, the the verbiage I hear um, from like the non lead partnership and those folks, particularly because uh, we get a lot of like, would I have a whole closet full of lead? What am I supposed to do with it? Um, is that it's okay to shoot at the range and just don't shoot in the field. So, um, again, like to me, I would prefer there weren't, you know, there wasn't lead at all. But the fact of the matter is, if they go to the range and they're shooting at the range, it's, it is fairly contained and not, um, not a risk. Um, the same way a gut pile is. Um, so that's what, what they might suggest, you know, that it's okay. Now, Mike McTee, if he gives his talk, he did his master's. He's kind of on, like environmental chemist on sporting clays and the clays themselves that were supposed to be environmentally friendly. Uh, when they interact, I think, with lead, they just break down and degrade and do bad things to the soil. So, again, that's not like a direct effect on wildlife, but it's not great for the environment in general. Um, but I hope that answered your question. So we pretty much just tell people, fine, shoot at the range, just, uh, you know, when you're going to shoot or be ready to hunt. And of course, test your gun with the ammo you're going to use at the range and then use the copper in the field. Yep, that answers it. Thanks. So I don't know if you can see that chat box, Kate, on your end, but it looks like folks are commenting about um, yeah, being a hunter, participating, but no, um, no questions rolling in. Okay. Just yet. Well, that's fine. I liked uh, the variety of folks here. It's great. I mean, I don't know. I am curious. Um, the whole kind of gun rights thing and the prevalence of guns here versus uh, where you guys are. I'm guessing is a fairly different. Is that? Uh, like a correct assumption. Hi, uh, I'm Ross Headley. I live in Vancouver, British Columbia, and I manage hunting on an island in the Gulf Islands where it was overrun with fallow deer. So there's been a very intense hunting program there. And um, we have a lot of bald eagles um, mm -hmm. that come in in the winter. Um, and I encourage the use of um, copper. Um, but don't require it and so taking a similar approach to you and the thing about what i think is awesome about what you've achieved and i think it's the only way you can achieve it from what i would understand is um, not trying to force people to use copper but to get the conversation going and it's a slower start and it might be frustrating at the beginning but look at what's happening is the community is um 
pursuing that from within. And that's way more powerful than um, particularly in, in the US, which has a very different political culture than Canada. Um, you know, I just think it's way more effective in, in the long run and <laughs> maybe right now way more effective. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure it's been hard to not uh, advocate hard, but uh, soft sell, you know, really works. The thing about copper is once you sight your gun in, I mean, typically when you're hunting, you know, you sight in with a certain ammo and, and hunters end up settling on an ammunition that they hunt with. Um, and performance is a big deal. Um, copper bullets have a huge following in the hunting community, in the serious hunting community, because they're it's extremely effective. Um, and I think the vast majority of the hunting population are really care about wildlife, really care. And when the conversation comes from within, um, I think it'll just snowball and it becomes moral suasion and becomes culture. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, it, you know, as soon as you try and preach at them or um, force the issue, it's just going to blow up in your face, right? So anyway, yeah. good for you guys. And it's excellent. Well, I have a couple comments and, and thanks for your, you know, your comments. I just mentioned to you that a couple of the other things we've done, which have been helpful, is offering incentives. Um, we've worked with local sporting goods stores uh, to offer discounts, you know, have some promotions and offer discounts on the copper ammo to again, like, you know, if the cost is a barrier. Um, but we also, <laughs> because we have some private funding, we give people ammo. Uh, we actually know, like, give ammo to our wardens. So when they have to dispatch something, you know, they get a call on a wounded deer. In the past, they would use lead because that's what they're issued. And now we give them copper. And so that's just another thing we've done too with the hunters on our property. If they don't, or for whatever reason, don't have it available, we just have a certain amount and we have a shooting range that they can sight in their gun and um, just try to reduce all of the barriers that we can. Um, but yep, I totally agree with all the stuff you were saying about it coming from within. I, it's it's been interesting for me as a non hunter and also as a female because it is a very um, male dominated um, culture and that like all our the groups you know it might be fifty men and one woman that come to some of the sporting groups stuff but I feel like in a way it's almost worked to my advantage because um, I don't play I don't play dumb I guess I feel like I'm just being honest and open about the fact that I really don't know hunting the way they do. And um, and sometimes I think being a female is a little, little bit of an advantage there, I guess. I don't know. I feel like there's maybe a little more forgiveness for what I don't know than if I were a guy. So anyway. Well, if you don't know it, don't pretend you know it. Yeah. You know, they'll yeah. smell really mm -hmm. fast. I do have one comment that you were talking about, um, you know, how much do you spend on hunting and stuff like that? And um, and your comment was, you know, you got the fancy pants and you spend money on beer. To me, that really feeds into kind of a negative stereotype on hunters. And, you know, just like a little flag goes up, like people spend crazy amounts of money on hunting uh, and you don't need to bring beer into the issue. Uh, they spend a ton of money on guns and scopes and other shooting and hunting equipment and knives, all kinds of stuff. And, um, you know, there's plenty of examples. So I just throw that out there just as a way of um, helping you communicate positively. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I think Mike made that slide. Just I feel like the, there was he was looking for something that cost about the same amount. But I agree. You it wasn't a it. slide. It was just something that uh, at least I don't think it was. I think it was just you there know, was probably a, just part of your shtick, you know. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we could but certainly do spend ridiculous amounts of money on equipment, and everyone knows that. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, what's the price of and and regarding someone else's question about shooting at the range with lead versus well, the fact is that um, you can buy lead ammo that's, um, you know, half the price of copper. And typically, if you're sighting in or just shooting at the range, people will use lead. Why not? Um, other than, yeah, it's not great 
to be spraying lead around anywhere and the lead doesn't disappear, it's still there. But um, typically the advice would be, hey, if you're gonna use, you know, if, if cost is an issue, site in with lead. And then when you finish siting in, do your final site in with copper and don't mess with your gun uh, uh, while you're out hunting. Don't, don't change ammo because different ammo shoots to a different point of aim out of a given gun. Uh, so, um, you know, but once you get people sighting in with copper, they'll stick with it because it's a big hassle to switch, right? Um, so I think it's a sticky sort of momentum that works in your favor. Mm -hmm. No, thanks. I just want to jump in real quick and say that the meeting was scheduled to wrap up uh, in about seven minutes. So I don't know if it cuts. I've never got to the end of a WebEx schedule if it's going to cut us off. So I apologize in advance if that is the case. It should uh, be fine, Jess. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. I just want to, but I know uh, Kirsty Gurney, Kirsty Gurney uh, popped a bunch of questions in there. I just didn't want uh, this to get cut off uh, before Kate got a chance to, yeah, address those. So yeah, I think you can, you can see all those questions in the chat. Yeah. I just changed my screen around. So I'm looking for the chat. Um, I did see one about, I'm curious if MPG is collecting data on other species at the gut piles. Yeah, we are. Um, we had even, we had a student helping us process that because you can imagine it's kind of tedious, but fun. Um, we're maybe three quarters of the way of processing all of that data. And that will be a publication, um, both because just the species that are coming and kind of, it's cool, the order they come in, the longevity of a gut pile, and I'm really fascinated with both the gut piles and some of the sites that we used for that winter eagle project with the deer. Um, you see all sorts of changes, like there's different plants growing from the nutrients and you see butterflies coming and beetles and um, the life of dead stuff is very fascinating to me. Um, so, oh, and then have we quantified the lead in gut piles at all? We haven't, but if you go on that hunting with non -lead, uh, dot org site, there are several studies on there um, that have gone and, you know, radiographed or x-rayed the gut piles. Um, any Hello? other questions? Hi. Did my mic just work? I can hear you. Okay, because it wasn't working before. Yeah, no, I think it's fascinating what you guys are doing in Montana. Like, this is huge amount of interest to me. And just as a personal note, I am a hunter, but I hunted for about two years before I even knew that lead was an issue. And I'm also a scientist who's now working on lead issues. So I'm kind of like really, especially fascinated in this interface of the education piece and how like I as a hunter and a scientist could not have known that lead was bad <laughs> until about till very recently actually and now exclusively hunt with copper but um so we've started this project here in saskatchewan where we're looking at lead in gut piles and we're actually doing a very similar thing to what you talked about with the trail cams and i thought it was really interesting that you were saying um you didn't tell the hunters that the trail cam work was for lead and i think it's uh yeah, great idea because we've actually run into that issue where um, hunters are like, yeah, I'm not putting up a trail cam for you tree huggers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yep, yeah. And did you ever run into that, I guess, and kind of like, um, is that part of the reason why you decided to not talk about the fact that, that, what, that partly that's what the trail cams were going to be used for? Well, I guess I should maybe rephrase that. We have never made a connection and we won't like when we publish it that this is a lead project or you know what i mean like we were um we just are talking about scavengers and um i don't even think in the discussion that we have outlined or we're bringing up lead at all we just want it to be a uh, again i think all of the hunters will make that that logical leap or have that conversation without us stating it and so it just seemed cleaner uh, to avoid it and use that project to both like learn about the gut piles and then use that as the relationship building to eventually have a conversation about lead. And um, that's kind of how it worked. I mean, we, especially with folks like Boone and, you know, Boone and Crockett, or, I mean, these are big organizations 
And, um, you know, we even had someone from Rocky Mountain Health Foundation participate and they are like, uh, <laughs> their needle hasn't moved at all. But, um, but you can talk to individuals about it. And I think that some of those conversations are exactly what made Boone and Crockett finally be like, wow, you know, this is a thing. Other organizations are now commenting. And, uh, you know, I see five eagles on my gut pile and, you know, we're going for it. So that was kind of a long rambling uh, discussion point. But I'd love to hear more about what you're what you're doing and what your your hopes are and you know what you're finding. It would be cool. There's a woman I think in Minnesota, maybe Minnesota, that was doing something similar that we've been in touch with, um, working with hunters and gut piles. And I think her project might be up on Zooniverse. I'm not positive. Yeah, I definitely would love to chat with you offline at some point more about what you guys have been doing. And just uh, like I say, the education piece is big. I think specifically now in Canada, we're starting to work with some of the Indigenous communities about lead education. Um, mm -hmm. Because, uh, yeah, in a lot of, well, some parts of Northern Canada that I've been to, you actually can't buy non-lead ammunition. And truthfully, we've run into that issue even in Saskatchewan where hunters, me as a hunter, I've gone into, um, I won't name the store, but and not been able to purchase non-lead bullets. Mm -hmm. I have to load my own often. So um, there's kind of that interesting piece too of trying to make it more available in in, yeah. in all places, right? That's tough because it really is like here, it's really hard for people to get any of the ammo they want. Uh, another trick we've done, um, that I don't know, I think it's just ethical, but I go into, again, not as a hunter or fisherman, I go into Cabela's and this was an idea from Adam Shredding from Raptor View. It's just go in repeatedly, you know, well, different people are working and ask for like, where's the non-lead fishing stuff? Where's the non-lead ammo? And, you know, it's just that whole repeating the message over and over again. You know, if you're just like, oh, I got an extra five minutes, I can run into Cabela's and just, you know, like, where's the, where would I find non lead fishing tackle if I wanted, wanted it? Um, that at some point that's going to get across to them. Yeah, I think we had a member of our group who was in Cabela's and, or was it a wildlife vet? I can't remember. And her overheard the staff saying, oh, you don't need non lead ammo anyways. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, yeah, like the education piece, I think, can't be understated, but the science working in coordination with that is, I think, really what you guys have done is obviously working well and it's fascinating. Yeah. Well, I'd and I just wanted to say, yeah, yeah, I want to just say, too, you don't feel bad or, you know, like the whole, there are so many people that don't know about the lead fragmenting. I mean, it sometimes you'll talk to a hunting group and it's like 75% of the people don't just don't know. And so, again, just stating that it happens is almost uh, enough for a lot of people. So, okay, there's a question about ravens. Is lead as toxic in ravens as it is in eagles? That's a great question. I don't personally know. I, I don't personally know. Uh, of course, like Brian, Brian Bedrosian has tested ravens. Um, I would just keep in mind though, ravens, they're, well, I don't know what their lifespan is. I'm guessing it's much shorter than an eagle. Um, so that's one of the issues with eagles is they can live for so long and if they keep accumulating it over and over again, then um, that's part of their the problem. Yeah, I think Pam Martin has a note there that lead can be as toxic to ravens as eagles. So. I think but the other thing, too, is just thinking about th these are just great ecological questions. That, again, I'm not saying I know, but I think one of the reasons we think we see lower lead in the balds versus the goldens is in the winter. The balds still have a broader um, diet than goldens do. Goldens are almost exclusively scavenging on carrion at that point, whereas the, the balds in our area, uh, they're still eating waterfowl and in some cases fish. So. Um, it's just interesting to think about. I think ravens too probably have maybe a few more options than some of the eagles might. Okay, and Steve hunted with an eight lead for twenty years. Yeah, I know. That's what we get. We uh, lots of people are very curious about testing themselves for lead um, and say, I, I think it's hard. I think with people you have to do a bone test. It's not simple to see where you're at, what your lead level is.
Okay, well, it's getting kind of quiet. Yeah, I guess we could give it a minute or two for any of the last, but we've been yeah, we've been here for a good bit, so maybe folks are. Yeah. Thanks for sticking around. I, yeah. I mean, I think it's fascinating. I also am like, God, how did I even get into this? I just want to hang out with Lewis Woodpeckers. But, um, you know, it really just seems so ripe for change. And uh, again, it, to me, it just seems like so easy in a way, if you can just get the communication out. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I guess, can I, sorry, I'm totally monopolizing things here, but I'm super interested in this stuff. So like, this has been my life for the past little while is working on lead. Um, so anything that you saw at the gut piles um, that Kate, that would, you would be a surprise to you? That was a surprise to you besides the ungulates, you mentioned them, but like, have there been things that you would not have expected? I'm trying to think, you know, I took the slide out of all the creatures that came because I just didn't have time. Um, you know, we got small, not too many small birds, but we did have things. I can't remember if we got a Clark's Nutcracker, you know, just some jays, um, really tiny. You know, I had, I think that picture, one of them had a chickadee in it eating off the gut pile. Um, goshawks. Um, I don't know if we got owls. Uh, we could certainly got owls that are on our other, the Winter Eagle Project, where there was much more mass out there. Grizzly bears, black bears. Um, i trying to think of anything else. The ungulates, to me, are the biggest surprise, and it happens a lot. The ungulates check stuff out a lot. Yeah, I was just curious. We saw some things totally that were surprising to me on our camera footage, and one was a great horned owl, actually. Okay. Yeah, I landed yeah. right on the gut pile and was going to town. Yeah, they scavenge on our deer, you know, on our other project a lot. And I think they're, you know, they have a territory nearby. So it's like if we actually have uh, pictures of them copulating on top of a deer carcass, which I was really surprised at. Um, we did also catch, we we caught a poacher on one of our gut cam piles or gut cam cameras. And I'm trying to think, we had some other like we brought in the law. I mean, we had some good footage from something else. I can't remember what it was. Cool, yeah. So um, I guess with that we can, oh, uh, I guess there's a few more. Um, <laughs> uh, how to access, so, okay. So Mike McTee's talk, it hasn't been established um, yet as far as a date, but that's going to be through the Saskatchewan chapter of the Wildlife Society. So um, I'll try to type in the, the URL. Um, I think it's just uh, this. So that'll come probably later in the year. Um, yeah, I think that's the, or .org, I'm not sure. But, um, but yeah, that'll be later in the year. Um, and we'll advertise for that on social media and email chains, I'm sure. And then yeah, yeah. Mercy mentioned the mailing list. And yeah, if you haven't if you haven't already been on this mailing list, um, just include your email here in the chat, and we can put your name. Yeah, just drop your email here in the chat, and we will uh, include you uh, for the future wild e calls. And um, yeah, yeah, absolutely, Kirsty, we'll do. Um, I think I hit all the questions. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Kate. Um, that was great. An awesome talk. I bet we could hang out for a while longer and talk more into the, the evening, but um, we'll let everyone go. Let everyone go and, yeah, continue the conversation with Mike and in the future. And uh, uh, Jess has my info if people want to get in touch. And, um, yeah, thank you for your time. Cool. Thanks, Kate. Thanks so much. Okay.